So uh, you've had these indicators, you've taken your indigenous forces out with you and, and you're suddenly struck by um, all of these indicators that aren't part of the norm. You've been in Vietnam six months now and um, you've, you've established yourselves as partners with the CIDG. You go out on these patrols that really have no intention of making contact. You're gathering some intelligence, but it's pretty benign. Yes. And now you've, you've had two instances where you've run into full NVA battalions that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And so as an, obviously a trained intel man, you know, that, that's uh, resonating with you as it is with probably others. Yeah. Um, so you're working up to the time when the actual Tet Offensive begins, which yes. is initiated by by the North Vietnamese in a coordinated way, a semi-coordinated way. And this is February 1968. And so talk about the night that Tet actually kicks off. Well, well, uh, the night w was very strange because, uh, you know, we know about the big battles, mm -hmm. Way Fu Bai, Saigon, mm -hmm. the big assaults. Uh, my A-team was totally quiet. They have to remember there was supposed to be a Tet ceasefire. So, so uh, out of respect for their yeah, New Year, for it's the a holiday. Year, for it the was Vietnamese. a holiday. All the Vietnamese. That's that is their New Year, uh, the Lunar New Year, and so technically there was supposed to be a ceasefire. So everybody's guard was pretty much down, yeah. and even though we'd had these precursors, we really didn't have we didn't have the intel that anything was going on. Right. We just knew something, but it, we didn't think of it for Tet. And I had actually been, had flown into Tam Ki, the province headquarters from the A-team, uh, to buy Tet presents for our counterparts, <laughs> much like we would give Christmas presents. We had taken up collection. And then the first day I got there, I was just kind of hanging loose, mm -hmm. going to go out into the economy the next day. And uh, that was the night where, where Tam Ki got hit. Mm -hmm. So I happened to be in Tam Ki, away from my A-team, by myself, and had sort of attached myself to the MACV, Military Adv Assistance Command Vietnam, uh, just to, uh, knew their, their, their uh, NCOIC and sort of mm -hmm. buddied up with him. So I, I hung with him that night. Wow. And uh, it wasn't... Kind a, of a naked feeling. You're out there oh, without your team yeah, but, on but, a combat shopping trip. Yeah, but, but <laughs> yeah, really, just going out Christmas shopping right. And, right. and you talk about Black Friday here. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, That's Black Friday. It was, it was a real surprise, but uh, but again, I think it was that special forces thing that mm -hmm. you adapt to wherever you are. Yeah. Even if you're by yourself, uh, you do the best you can. And uh, I was helping this guy out. I had known him from a previous trip, so we had sort of a bond. But uh, the MACV people, these people were not combat arms. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all clerks and commo guys, so they weren't directly involved in the defense. Tam Key didn't get the kind of assault the other things went, yeah. but it was it was more comical for me than anything mm -hmm. else because I ended up on the top of the commo bunker in a machine gun bunker. Uh, the that uh, commo NCO I see I knew he brought up a bucket of popcorn and beer, and I spent the evening watching the artillery unit across the uh, road trade uh, rounds with the VC rocket forces outside. Uh, and I think it's probably two o'clock in the morning or so it died down and the assault stopped. Wow. So you're, you're drinking beer and eating popcorn with a front row seat yeah. to the uh, North Vietnamese attack on the unit across the street because yeah. they don't really realize where you are or you're not one of the listed well, targets. Well, we would have been a target had they gotten through the perimeter. Okay. So in a sense, if, if ground troops had broken through, okay. things would have got very busy right. for us. Right. But as it was, it was more of an artillery duel going on. Okay. Uh, there were uh, ground assaults in other parts of Tam Ki, mm -hmm. but not exactly. They didn't break through where we were. Okay. So again, you know, I, I don't remember. I think it was about two o'clock. Things quieted down, and we were on alert the rest of the night. But uh, everybody was down in the mess all then, mostly paying pinochle. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You get to kill the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and you also uh, talked to me earlier that no one else knew how to use the machine gun and the machine well, gun. Well, yeah, they, they had an M60 machine gun, a sign, you know, that the, the combo guys had, but none of them knew how to use it, so they were happy to, to have somebody there that could be up in the bunker and actually could load it and fire it, yeah. as well as the next day, uh, these guys were linemen. They weren't radio, all radio men, 
and they had to replace a lot of the down combo wire. Yeah. And so I went out with them and I was their security. You know, I took the M60 out because even after Tet, I couldn't get out for a while because of all the ch chopper problems sure. and stuff. So I, I hung with those guys for a while. Sure. Uh, and but, it's actually that next morning where you you acquire a couple of souvenirs that are behind us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were working our way down the road and we got in front of the provincial headquarters and it was uh, one of those big large buildings you see in the movies or, or you know, the photos of, had, a, had a, a, a U drive. And along one side of the drive, there were some VC stacked up like cordwood. So that, VC that corpses, bodies. Bodies had come in there and the, the guys had been policed up and of course, uh, those guys are all stripped of all of their gear and any intelligence they might be carrying. And uh, I have no idea what happened to them later, if they were, how they were treated. But as a result of that, I was given some war souvenirs. I was given a, a pistol belt, which was well worn uh, as the star on the clasp. Oh, oh yes, it's right, it's right here. here. Wow. And, and, and you... really, you know, you can see how worn it is, worn by a VC. And... The amazing thing, you, you probably can't see, but how small it is. That's right. That, uh, that's like uh, Audrey Hepburn would wear yeah. this, right? In the, in the uh, uh, I mean, look at that waist uh, right there. And, and like what Mike is saying, I mean, look at how worn, this is probably his pack is resting here and, and is wearing this down. You also see, and in, in, uh, only a, a field soldier can, can forensically look at this and, and see, this is the sweat stains here, I mean, this is highly worn. This is not your uh, your standard uh, souvenir uh, that that wasn't employed. I yeah. mean, this is straight off the battlefield. Yeah, this doesn't come off the black market. No, <laughs> yeah. no, this isn't a pair of uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh sandals that are made 20 years later and uh, exactly. sold to tourists. Okay, yeah. this is a real. This is something uh, real. So this comes off of one of these dead yeah, Vietnamese no yeah. there. But, but I really think, um, as interesting as that is, uh, what I've got behind here, and this is clearly the, the best looking Viet Cong uh, that you actually, so. <laughs> good, so look, good looking eyes back there. <laughs> that's right. This is a supermodel of the, of the Viet Cong here. Um, she, this woman's picture behind is really uh, to illustrate what its use is and what this is all about. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, kind of lean out of the way here so that Mike can take you through what this is. Okay, uh this is a good example of what the VC were willing to fight with. Now we did not we're not allowed to use gas in Vietnam. Even tear gas was was something we could not use. But they carried these gas masks just in case. And the Vietnamese anybody who was in Vietnam knew knew that the Vietnamese all wore poncho like uh raincoats. You know, and, and it was made out of this black plastic. Civilians, everybody wore them. So this is all hand-stitched. Uh, a clear plastic eye visor is hand-stitched in. And for over the face, they have a piece of uh, medical gauze hand-stitched in, which when water was put on, it probably would have had some filtering ability. And then, and then some blue plastic straps here to tie it around the neck to tighten it right. up. Uh, so the, the gear that they were able to go into combat with is just amazing. It, show, it shows how well motivated, motivated these little guys yeah, were. Yeah, I mean, the, the resolve uh, to, that somebody would have to have to wear something like this into a, a combat environment, the determination, I mean, do not underestimate the enemy. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and along with this, I was able to get a hold of two propaganda posters. It was interesting. Uh, they're bl actually blood stained. They have the VC blood on them, you know, which was, which was a, uh, sort of a, a a sad and happy thing, you sure. know, when you get to this point. Sure. But interesting enough, one of them was a recruiting post poster from the Vietnamese Special Forces, recruiting into our outfit, the CIDG. Uh, the Vietnamese Special Forces were Luc Long Duc Biet was what they were referred to, and the other one was a poster put out by the NVA telling the civilians that Tet was coming to not, you know, very, you know, talking about Americans in very derogatory terms and that how they should get away from all the billets and barracks and get away that, that this offensive was coming in. Wow. So this guy was carrying one of both, uh, right. or at some point there was two of these, these posters. So were... for you, how long did the Tet Offensive last? There was that night, yeah. uh, popcorn, beer, and uh, yeah. a relatively quiet. Uh, how long did you see the residual effects of Tet? 
There wasn't any. No. No, even the next day when we went out there and to put up those That was wires, over. That was over in Tam Key. Well. Wow. Now, it kept up in Hue and other places. Yeah. But you have to understand in Vietnam, if it wasn't happening with 100 meters of you, you didn't really care about it. Huh. So after a couple of days there hanging loose, uh, I was able to get a flight back to my A-team. I went back to A-team. It was work as usual. Nothing had happened there. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, even, uh, I mean, over a beer or something, you might talk about it. But it, it was like it was yesterday's newspaper. Yeah. What's kind of interesting about it, it was your impression being on the ground and seeing it with your own eyes yes. to know that we won Tet hands down. But I think it's interesting to interject in here in that strategically, uh, Tet had a different effect because for years, the U.S. government had been telling its people they're on their last legs. This is yeah. the last gas. They have no capability to launch an offensive yeah. like this. And what this basically did was discredit what our government had been telling the American yes. people for so long. It wasn't a, a calculated victory as the people like you who were fighting there yeah. understood it to be. Well, it was an absolute failure from their perspective. No. Because even though they were able to take territory, they moved into Saigon, yeah. they took the embassy, yeah. they weren't able to hold it. And again, it was the propaganda fed to our people that made that look bad. That's right. You know, and so it was lost that our forces pushed them completely out. Hui Fu Bai, I mean, it was, mm -hmm. I mean, that fight is classic with what the Marines did to get them out right. of there. But they, but they were in trouble from the minute they got involved with the Americans. Uh, but, and also the whole idea was the Vietnamese people were supposed to rise up against us mm -hmm. and, and nobody did that. So tactically, it was a terrible loss for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, propaganda wise and strategically in this country, yeah. the attitude and, and the famous uh, uh, radio announcer, TV announcer, Walter Cronkite, who had, had the ears of the nation uh, he had been totally with the war, you know, uh, backing us up. Uh, There's even, I mean, he had film of him getting into spads, the A1Es and mm -hmm. flying and stuff. And right after Tet, he said, okay, I was wrong. We're losing this war, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. This has happened. And it was one of the sad things that the American people were tired of the war anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when the, right. it really turned against the war. So. So I went from the, the build-up, from what General Westmoreland's build-up, we only need this many more troops, and probably if we'd gotten more troops, we would have been more successful, but who would know? Sure. But then when I went back to Vietnam on my second tour, I was there for the Vietnamization. Yeah. So a year in the States, going from we're winning, you know, until Tet, and then it ran down that quickly to, to what would have been two years later, roughly, that I went back there, uh, no, a year later, uh, that the, it, that we were pulling out. It was all falling apart. And the sad part of there is any private there knew that the Vietnamese were not going to be able to hold their own against the North Vietnamese. So it was that great sense of we're quitting, we're, we're abandoning. abandoning. Yeah, but abandoning. it wasn't our choice. Sure. You know, uh, there were many people would have would have stayed there as civilians if it. You know, if you want to fight as mercenaries, you yeah. can stay here. Yeah because uh, a lot of us had gotten very attached right. to our, our counterparts. So I just thought that was interesting. We talk about a, a great tactical victory on the ground, but we talk about it being a turning point strategically in this country. Yeah. Um, here you all are deployed forward, and you're saying, well, what, what are you talking about? You know, Tet, we, we wiped the floor with them. Yeah. And really, you don't understand the effect that that has on the country yeah. um, back home. So well, the bottom line is, Military are, are, are trained to understand this. Mm -hmm. And in World War II, they got their censored news reports and everything was, was hunky-dory. It was mm -hmm. all victory and this. Or, or when they would show a battle it, that we were losing, it was more for the patriotism and we've got to help our boys overseas. During Vietnam, with the news constantly there, people looking over your shoulder, and all of this unfiltered stuff getting back to the American people, to moms and wives and whatever, there's nothing nice about warfare. You cannot de-brutalize warfare. 
And all of these sudden, these people are getting unfiltered pictures of what's going on, mm -hmm. and they did not have the ability to understand. Right. You have to lose a little bit. Right. You have to lose some ground to make the right. bigger. They're victory. arriving at their own conclusions, yeah. and Tet gives them an excuse uh, to uh, to question what's happening. Yes. So the the peace movement that was already in progress, and, and you know, I had no objection to a peace movement per se, but that's when the the whole country sort of, and and it and then and then it turned out they you know of course they villainized the 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 American soldiers yeah. serving there as as part of that you know love hate relationship going way the other side. Yeah, yeah, no, that's interesting.